unfolded that a little while. This is what's actually happening. These are the sorts of issues that are going on and the demands that are happening in relation to technology in terms of uh, keeping in touch with colleagues and all the needs are happening in the media. Uh, looking at curricular documents. I don't know how your the powers that be here in Pakistan or with the Deakin House will communicate with you, but in the United Kingdom, the days are long gone when you get paper copies or anything. You know, everything is PDF. And because PDF is very easy to generate and distribute, to distribute and very cheap, you get thousands of those uh, documents raining in on you, having to try and make sense of that. Yeah? So you've got that happening. Got resources, you've got resources. So, in order to be effective, the argument is here. The teacher, in a sense, has to become networked in these ways and has to proactively seek to be networked. Gone, I would argue, are the days when you could go into your classroom, close the door behind you, yeah. and inhabit a world of your own which nobody ever knew anything about. Yeah. And uh, no one dared ask the question. Yeah. And no one would dare ask the question. Yes, yeah. And classroom is the territory of a teacher. Yeah, yeah. So all of that has changed, partly because of technology, to part because of things. And we need to just recognize that and we need to start. And these are the, these are the sorts of things that, that are happening there. And of course, the corollary, since you mentioned teacher education and that, uh, again, uh, in the literature, is this particular concept. You might have heard about pedagogical content knowledge. In some other areas where I come from, uh, they talk about it as subject didactics. Yeah? Uh, in the US, they don't like the term, uh, they use pedagogical content knowledge. And there's these two chaps, Fisher and Kohler, uh, who for a little while now uh, have been saying, yeah, what's, you know, okay, what, what, are you all familiar with the notion of pedagogy and content knowledge? Originally there was this thing, teachers, all they need to know is their stuff. Yeah? They need to have subject knowledge. Yeah? If they had a first class degree in Latin, the classics, then they can teach Latin, they know it all. Well, and then we start to think, well, hang on a minute, maybe there's more to it than that. Yeah? Maybe it's about learning or knowing about what's easy and what's difficult about the subject. Um, what students might uh, find particularly easily learnable or what might be more difficult for them. And we need something like pedagogical content knowledge. So content knowledge itself isn't enough. We need actually to know uh, how to teach this thing and what possible ways there are. And now these two guys are coming over and saying, oh, uh, hang on a minute. Yeah? We also need to know what's going on with technology. Yeah? And so they're introducing this whole thing about technological knowledge. Yeah? You need to know how to operate the technology. Yeah? What happens if your printer doesn't work all of a sudden? Yeah? Is it the printer driver? Has the cartridge gone empty? Is the fuse blown? And, and just, yeah? All the, those sorts of things. And uh, so you need a bit of that. But then you also need technological content knowledge and technological pedagogical knowledge. Yeah? So how can I use this thing for teaching? And what's the role of this technology in the context of my subject? Yeah? So, to stay with my example of the language teacher again, and I apologize to some extent, but language use is what we're preparing young people for. Yeah? But what does language use look like in the beginning of the 21st century? It's talking on the mobile phone, it's sending uh, Twitter messages, it's chatting online. Yeah, this is very different. So the nature of language use is profoundly impacted upon by technology. And I need to know about that, yeah? and I need to know what's going on there. And only then can I start to think about and what are the pedagogical implications of this. How do I teach this? If so, how do I teach this? And that's what they call this, and since you've mentioned sort of teacher development uh, on a few occasions, my argument with, would be very clearly what we do need is a concerted effort within the process of formation, of teacher formation and teacher development to lose. I just carried out a one year study with two colleagues from BECTA, the, 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 the organization in the UK responsible for uh, technology. And one of the things we looked at is 
how do teachers learn about the use of ICT across all subjects. And one of the statistics that I found very interesting was in the UK at any one time, there's about 450,000 teachers, active teachers. And every year, 30,000 new teachers get trained. So how long would it take if only through the means of focusing concertedly in teacher education on technology to actually make sure that the whole teaching population would be uh, knowledgeable a long time and then what's happened to technology in, in that time uh, you know when somebody had their training to uh, that period lots of things have changed so teacher education is one answer but it's not the answer so clearly teacher development is, 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 is where uh, the, the effort is placed. And realistically, teacher development is all well and good, and it's great to be here and for all, all of us to meet to have sessions like this, but you can't do this every day. Too expensive, too impractical, pra impractical to go. And that's why we come back to where we were a minute ago. That's why oops, that's, this might be part of the solution becoming net network with teachers and others and using more informal ways to keep up with these developments. Somebody here mentioned Teachers TV for example. Yeah? There is uh, uh, the opportunity to use digital video resources. There are specialist uh, sort of YouTube competitor channels uh, just for teachers and, and, and teaching materials. So to some extent the onus, I think, is as much on us as it is on government and on yes. employers to provide opportunity to actually make the best out of all of these opportunities because uh, otherwise, let, let's put it this way, in my humble opinion, the need for teachers is not going to be replaced very soon. Eh? It's highly unlikely that schools will finish, and even if school finish, then there's still no where to finish, which I don't think, educators. But what is much more likely, if not inevitable, is the need for teachers who don't know anything about technology. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the role for them is going to become very, very minimal, and uh, the expectations will be. So it's in our own self-interest and self-preservation to actually engage with this meaningfully because that's how the world around us moves, that's how things change. And so we've got so this thing, oh we've got this IT specialist in school and they'll do it is not going to be the answer. Yes. Yeah? And it's also not going to be the answer because our the children we work with out there, they live in extremely media rich lives. And I don't haven't worked in Pakistan, but I've got a little bit of experience working in South Africa. And so I know about levels of deprivation and levels of you know, access to technology. And there's this very interesting project that is, uh, these uh, few people have been involved with, have done, of actually uh, doing digital storytelling, writing novels on mobile phones with disadvantaged uh, learners developing their literacy skills. So even in those contexts where you'd say, you know, where do they get the technology? It, it is happening. And there is an expectation there. This is what young people do. And when they come then into school, and you confront them with means of engaging with information that are completely alien to them and different to the ways in which they do it in their own world, you'll have that much more problem keeping them enthused and keeping them uh, motivated and, and, and all the rest of it. So I think there's a, a, a fair good reason to do that. Now, maybe table at the back, was there anything uh, you wanted to share with us since we've got about five minutes left? Would you like to share? <coughs> the first thing is we got awareness of uh, the technology. Yeah. The uh, second thing is uh, we learned certain competencies in designing these traditional materials. Yeah. So we can borrow them from the net and from other people. But if personally design them, is actually to first know how to use them. Yeah. So how to develop them. Yes. Yeah. That is actually the point that is lacking in that in yeah. particular. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to work on that. Yeah. 
So uh, you're absolutely right, learning design is a very important aspect. And traditionally, until not too long ago, we were faced with a situation of people who tended to know quite a bit about technology designing solutions for us to problems they thought we had, but in reality we didn't have. Yeah? Just because they didn't know it. And it's only now that we have uh, tools at our disposal where it's less and less important to know about the technology, where you and I, I mean, I know very little about uh, programming, for example, are in a, like a hot potatoes, are in a position to start to create and design curricula and material that fit our needs. So I can use not the text that somebody might have decided might be good to do a comprehension quest, you know, an exercise with, but the text that I've just done with my learners, or even the text that my learners have written themselves uh, in the previous session, and use that as the basis for an, a technology uh, enhanced sort of uh, activity. So the design bit, uh, you are absolutely right is very important. And the other important thing is that not to think that you design something once and you implement it and that's it. But you need to have that feedback loop built in where you revisit the that and you uh, refresh it and you so that's something you need to take on board when you start off with that there's enough scope and flexibility in your design that you don't then have to start from scratch with uh, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. For this purpose, we have decided to develop a social network of, our, of this particular group. Yeah, excellent idea. And yeah. we have decided to extend our email address yes. so yeah. that we, can, we are able to create a social network yeah. and share. extend and share yeah. ideas, share lesson plans, yeah. and share our experiences yeah. with each other. Um, there, there, there is a number of tools that facilitate that very easily. Yeah. There's one totally that we have, we are at, uh, yeah. at least we, uh, both of us are already there on that Grouply network. What's it called? Grouply. Grouply, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, um, we have suggested them to be a member of Yes, yeah. That's exactly a very uh, good example. One yeah. uh, more important point is how to control okay, the pace, speak up a bit how to control the pace of e-learning. Yeah. This is one area where, like, we have designed some lessons and within schools, uh, conventionally we are doing a syllabus in three months. Yeah. A curriculum we are supposed to finish in three months. And now using e-learning techniques in a classroom interactive environment, yeah. we have finished in one month. Yeah. And what to do the next two months? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We are done in one month, still we are yeah. left in one month. So the pace the yeah. pace of learning and it's use, it's yeah. pace is very important. Yeah. You, you should be so lucky, I'm absolutely <laughs> delighted uh, uh, to, 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 to hear that. Like that. But, but one, of, one of the things, it doesn't relate directly to your point, but to your colleague's point. Since you mentioned e-learning in particular, one of the um, models that uh, is uh, relatively widely uh, referred to